Uh, before we jump into the message, I just wanted, since we've got some new faces here, we wanted to give a kind of a high level understanding of, of how uh, we look at God's word. Uh, in 2021, we did one message out of just about every book of the Bible. We went through the whole Bible and just preached one message to look at Christ. Now, as we've been going through uh, the Bible, we've been going through uh, the Bible in three years. So uh, in 2022, we looked at Genesis through Esther, so the historical accounts. And then in last year, we looked at wisdom genre and the prophets. This year, we're in the New Testament. Now, the New Testament, we've I've kind of broken it into four four chunks. We have four Gospels, four quarters. So we start in each of the Gospel accounts, and then we go through some of the, the pastoral epistles, some of Paul's epistles, and, and so on, to get us deep into the text. And my intention in doing that is to take the core message of whatever the book is and communicate it. And so... Uh, we've had June, uh, Jude on the docket for uh, the last seven months, and today we're going to be looking at the book of Jude. But before you turn there, I'd invite you to turn to Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. The title of today's message is, Keep Yourselves in the Love of God. This message is about understanding and addressing apostasy. Now, I recognize that term might not be familiar. We're going to talk about it. But this message is about looking at and dealing with apostasy. We're going to come at it from a bunch of different angles. If you have Numbers chapter 16 open, we're going to look at this fantastic account of apostasy as the nation of Israel, they've left Egypt, they've been wandering around in the wilderness, and there's been grumbling, there's been complaining. Now there's an uprising, an uprising against Moses, the Lord's prophet. I'm just going to, we're going to take little segments out of number 16 because it's a, it's a very long text if I read through all of it. It would take 14 minutes. We're not going to do that. We're just going to take a couple of snapshots out of there so we can get the sense of what the text is. Starting in verse 3. Then they, and they is Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and 250 other leaders of the congregation of Israel, they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone far enough for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and Yahweh is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of Yahweh? And Moses heard this and fell on his face. And he spoke to Korah and all his congregation, saying, Tomorrow morning Yahweh will show who is his and who is holy and will bring near to himself even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. There's a uprising of apostasy in Israel. And Moses' response is, is just horror. And then there's going to be a dealing with it. Let's just define what that apostasy is. Apostasy, according to the Lexham Bible Dictionary, is a public denial of a previously held religious belief and a distancing from the community that holds to it. The term apostasy is almost always applied pejoratively. It's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. If you're an apostate, that's a, that's a problem. Carrying connotations of rebellion, betrayal, treachery or faithlessness. This is Korah, Dathan, Abiram, the 250 other leaders of the congregation as they set their face against Moses and say, we're holy too. We should be leaders. What's funny is in the context, this group of men have 
just about the closest proximity to service within the tabernacle as anybody besides Aaron and his sons. They, they have the prestige. They have the honor. They want more. And they're forcing their way into it. Let's continue with the story, though. Uh, verses 23 through 26 continues. The, the Lord is going to warn. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses arose and went to Dathan and Abiram with the elders of Israel following him. Say, and he spoke to the congregation, saying, Turn aside now from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them, lest you be swept away in all of their sin. This is a, such a big problem. God's going to deal with them immediately. Apostasy is not a light sin, as if you could call it any sin light. It's a dramatic sin. Moses is going to prophesy now in verses 28 through 30. And Moses said, by this, you shall know that Yahweh has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not from my heart. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, then Yahweh has not sent me. But if Yahweh creates an entirely new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and they go down to Sheol, that's the grave, alive, then you will know that these men have spurned Yahweh. The proof will be in the judgment. When the, these men die an atypical death, then everyone will know that they were apostate. And this is the judgment that falls, verses 31 through 33. And it happened that as he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, and their households, and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down to Sheol alive, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. Nothing like this has ever happened before. The rebellion that Korah and Dathan and Abiram spawned was absolutely judged. Apostasy is a really big problem. We're going to be looking at apostasy today. But the main point that I want us to get, which is in the title, which is in the main point, which is the thesis, set, uh, the thesis statement and, and the absolute bare minimum that you got to get from this message is keep in the love of God. To address apostasy, to avoid apostasy, you need to soak deeply in the Lord and his word. And we're going to see that as we go to the text in Jude. Before we go into the text, we're going to look at the context. When we look at the context, then we understand, well, this is, this is why he's writing these things. This is why it's important. And that, that keeps us from deviating into our own uh, ideas. We can actually see what the author intended to speak. Then we're going to address the issue of apostasy as Jude addresses it. We're going to have some takeaways that really boil down to thinking biblically. And then we're going to conclude with looking ahead to the future. The basics of this message are to see an example of apostasy, see it addressed in Jude, and then see the whole uh, intended point reflected in a subsequent passage. So we're seeing it from multiple angles that sit, that tell us that Scripture speaks with unified voice on this topic. And we want to get it right. So before we jump into the main body of the message, let's open in prayer. Father God, we are so grateful for your word that we can know about you and your character. We can know who we are, we who are believers in Christ, 
and what our conduct and our thoughts are supposed to be like. You tell us how we are to address those that are doubting, those that are deceived, and those that are apostate. Lord, I pray that you will help us to be merciful as you yourself are merciful. Keep us in your love. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do the work that no one else can do. And I pray that we would be led by you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay, turn with me, if you would, to Jude chapter, or well, there's no chapters, it's only one chapter, verse 17. Before we jump into the text, let's look at the context. Who is Jude? Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. He serves with James in Jerusalem in the church. He's writing a letter to a bunch of different people, both Jews and Gentiles, but all of them are Christians. Who's he writing about? He's writing about these apostates, these lawless intruders that are deeply unhappy. They cause division, and they are both godless and ungodly. That's who he's writing about. And the bulk of the letter is identifying these folks. He wrote about five years before Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. And his main emphasis is to contend for the faith, which is our emphasis. Keep in the love of God and work together to grow in that. Jude wrote this letter to warn of the dangers of, that come from doubt, deception, and libertine heretics. That's not a word that a lot of people use. It's a, it's a word that connotes a, a, a free thinking about sexuality. They take license in that. They don't restrain themselves or restrict themselves to one man, one woman for life. They don't do that. No, they take license. Ultimately, Jude wants the Christians to know that believers must keep themselves in the love of God, which is my point, which is what we should come away with, deeply impressed from Jude of how important this is. So I've broken the text into three points. We're going to be looking at verses 17 through 19 first. The title of this point is Forewarned is Forearmed. But you, beloved, verse 17, must remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers falling after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions worldly-minded, not having the Spirit. We're warned about these people. As the apostles have warned, we have been warned from the beginning. And, and it's interesting, you know, Jude has been writing for verse after verse after verse about, about these apostates, but it starts out in verse 17, there's a contrastive, but you, there's a difference here between uh, these apostates that are identified and believers. There's a big difference between us. And he, and he emphasizes that with the word beloved, agape toy. You, cherished ones, that are warmly loved by the Father, you, beloved, you must remember, you must take this to heart, the words that were spoken by the apostles. What are the words that were spoken by the apostles? It's the New Testament. The New Testament rests on the foundation of the Old Testament. You must take these words to heart. Over and over again, as we get through this text, you're gonna be seeing just how important the word of God is. 
What were the apostles saying? They were saying to you in the last time, there will be mockers. Those are ones who jeer, ones who call out. They're dividers. They mock about the reality that is to come. They're dividers. They create factions. They are known as deceivers. This is a, that's a bad place to be. You know, I, I love my wife. I know you men, you love your wives. If anybody hurt your wife, you would be very, very difficult to deal with. I know. These deceivers are coming into the body of Christ, the bride, whom he loves, whom he died for. And they are creating chaos and carnage. They desire division. Acts chapter 20, verses 20, or verse 29 through 30 says, and this is Paul speaking, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. They have an intention and it's not a good one. Remember, take these words to heart. Be forewarned. There is danger. Now, I mentioned the believers, that they are the ones being talked to. They are different. Believers are different in that they seek unity and love, but they will never sacrifice truth to attain it. That is very common these days. You can find lots of churches that will say, we're unified, but they blow with the wind. That, that isn't true unity. Colossians 3 verse 14 says, above all these things put on love, and that's a sacrificing love, it's a self-giving up love, which is the perfect bond of unity. It is critical that we as believers love each other sacrificially. Here's a warning. Heretics draw others after them because they do not care about the eternal consequences of sin. Now, we know that about heretics. We know that about apostates. That does not surprise us. Of course, they don't. But to the degree that our lifestyle, our actions, our choices mirror that reality that we do not care about the eternal consequences of sin, we have that in common with them. That's a dangerous place to be. If we are telling ourselves that it's just okay, it's just a little sin, it's just, it's not going to be a problem. I've got it under control. Nobody can tell me. And yet the Holy Spirit is provoking us through this word. And we can't really escape him. We should care about the eternal consequences of sin. Christ did. He cared about him enough to die for it. So put that in your mind of just how important sin really is. These uh, deceivers, these heretics, they do not care about the eternal consequences of sin. And I think I've got the, the wrong uh, reference there. But this is from Second Peter, I believe, Second Peter 2 through 4. I'll just confirm that here. 2 through 4. No. Nope. Know this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, without gentleness, without love for good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, 
but having denied its power, keep away from such men as these. They're dangerous. Watch out. Okay, we've been forewarned. Now we're forearmed. We know what to look for, right? That, that makes all the difference. If you know who the, the enemy is, you can be on the alert for them. And their lifestyle is described by these choices. Let's continue. Verse 20 through 23. A well-rounded strategy does not involve just identifying the opponent. No, we've got to understand what our part is. And then we've got to understand, well, how do we deal with the folks that have been influenced by them? We're going to develop a well-rounded strategy from Jude in verses 20 through 23. But you, beloved, verse 20, again, that contrastive, we're different or cherish, or beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. We'll just stop there. We'll read the rest of the passage in a moment. But you, beloved. And then he gives three participles, these words that have I-N-G at the end that support this notion in verse 21, which is the main point of, of the message. Verse 21 says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Great, how? That's an imperative. Tell me, Jude, how ought I to be doing this? Step one, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Be building, be and this is a present, be doing this. Keep doing this. What? Building up our faith in God by believing what he says about himself, about us in his word. That matters. He's trustworthy. We can look at his word and depend on it. We can bank our eternity on it. 1 John 5.10 says, The one who believes in the Son of God has this witness in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the witness which God has borne witness about his Son. They said it to the Son. There's a difference between believers and unbelievers. Unbelievers said it. The truth aside, believers Cling to it. If you are going to keep yourself in the love of God, and this is an action that we do, we are to deepen our exposure, our sensitivity to God's word. Second step in this well-rounded strategy, be praying. Again, another participle. Keep on doing this. Be praying in the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean? That's kind of a weird phrase. How do you pray in the Holy Spirit? It is prayer. But I think prayer in talking to God is enhanced when we reflect on his word and we speak it back to him and we agree with him. And we thank him for that. Do you do that in your prayers? Do verses come to mind as you're praying, as you reflect on how he has said he is going to deal with your needs, your wants, your confessions? Do you think about what he says in his word? I would encourage you. It is very enriching. If your prayer life seems dry, take the time to ruminate on God's word. As you finish your devotions, as you finish spending time in God's word, pray his word back to him. Internalize it. You will find rich, satisfying, joyful prayer life in that. Romans 8:26. Verse 27, I didn't put it on here, but we'll just read verse 26. In the same way that Spirit also helps our weakness, 
for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Sometimes it's just noises from us, but the Lord knows what our wants are. And when we agree with him through his word, I have found myself encouraged and satisfied and at peace. A third step in this well-rounded strategy, another participle. Jude has this thing with the number three. There's three all over in this text. Waiting for Christ's return as proclaimed in his word. He says, build, oh, let's see, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Be waiting, be expecting, be looking ahead, be paying attention and waiting for eternity. Okay, how do you keep yourself in the love of God? Read his word, pray his word back to him and believe what his word says about the future. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 13 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, things that define these apostates, we should live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for, waiting for, anticipating, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you get anxious looking around at the world? <laughs> I do. Uh, we are to set our mind on things above. Do you want to keep in the love? Do you want to protect yourself from the danger of apostasy, which is all around us, by the way? Are you seeing the nation right now? If you were to keep yourself in the love of God, build yourself up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and waiting for our Savior. Another step in this well-rounded strategy is engaging the at-risk. We've looked at the apostates. We've looked at ourselves as believers. Now we look at those that are in danger. If we are keeping ourselves in God's word, we know people that are not. We know others that are not keeping in the love of God. What's our responsibility to them? Do we have one? You bet we do. You bet we do. Our first step, and we'll, I'll read verse 22 and 23. On some who are doubting, have mercy. And for others, save, snatching them out of the fire. And on others, have mercy with fear, hating even the tunic polluted by the flesh. Another three, right? He's got those that are doubting. They're saved, but maybe they're easily influenced. He has those that are deceived. They're following after these apostates. And then you have the apostates. What are we to be doing? Well, first off, and this happens over and over in this text, verse 21, verse 22, and verse 23, have mercy. Be lenient in spirit. Don't think, oh, well, that will never happen to me. This isn't in the Bible. It's not a verse, but it's a, somebody who once said, but for the grace of God, there go I. I remember looking at a transient going to a Bible class in Portland, and he was stumbling by the class screaming. A trainer of a human. And I was just astonished. Oh. And the, the doorkeeper said, but for the grace of God, there go I. And I know he's right. God has been gracious to me. He has been merciful to me, the sinner. We are to extend that mercy to those that are troubled in their faith. They don't find assurance because they strayed from the word, or maybe they're confused. You know the truth. Be merciful to them and teach them what it says. We're to be different. 2 Timothy 2 says, The Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, 
patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may give them repentance, leading to the full knowledge of the truth. We are to be merciful as God is merciful. So that's the first person that we're dealing with, the doubters. Now we're going to deal with the deceived. We're told in verse 22, and for others save, that means to rescue, to deliver, to free. It's an imperative. You do it. Whoa. There's a responsibility element to this. Save. And it's supported with a participle. Be snatching them out of the fire. Grasp them hastily and yank them out of the fire. This is our obligation. This helps us keep in the love of God. You remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Lot, what did the angels do? Those men that the Lord sent, what did they do with Lot when he delayed? Genesis 19 verse 16 says, but he hesitated. Lot, he didn't know what to do. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife, and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of Yahweh was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. God does this. We as children of God are to do it as well. Do you see somebody who is deceived, is straying after these bad doctrines that, that mutate legitimate faith? Do you see that? Snatch them. Intervene. Do something. What does that look like? Pray. The Lord is going to lead you. Seek counsel. But don't ignore it. Our third category of those that are at risk are the deceivers. Verse 23 tells us that we are to fear and hate the deceiver's sin. Verse 23 says, On others have mercy with fear. Again, an imperative. Hating even the tunic polluted by the flesh. There are those that are deceivers, that are luring our young people, our ignorant people, those that are easily influenced. They're luring them away. Catchy phrases like, love is love, does incredible damage. It is, what does that even mean? And yet, we'll hear our children, our teens, saying phrases like that and embracing it. Why can't we all just love however we want? God's word tells us. And I would argue that that isn't love, what that phrase seems to support. Proverbs 8 verse 13 says, the fear of Yahweh is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the mouth of perverted words I hate. This is wisdom speaking. He said, I don't want to hate. I don't want hate in my life. We are to hate the sin that put our best friend on the cross. We are to hate the sin that has condemned untold billions of people to death. Don't give license to sin. Don't agree with it and say, well, it's for him. He's okay. He's a good guy. Hate it. Fear it. Dread it because of a, of a dread and a fear of the Lord. And there's a respect element to that. It's not, for a believer, it's not a phobia. But the Lord takes sin seriously, so we are to take sin seriously. Having said that, having dealt with the forewarning and forearming in verses 17 through 19, dealing with the apostates and having looked at our actions, our strategy, Now we're going to ultimately trust God. 
The main point of the message was keep yourselves in the love of God. And that is an action that we participate in. And yet, <laughs> there is a, <laughs> our faith that says, I'm committing myself to God. In his goodness, and his character, he has said that he will save. I believe that. And so ultimately, we don't get anxious about this and, and, and freak out. We act as he says. And then we rest in him. We trust in him. Verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. Oh, couldn't you read that every day? <laughs> Beautiful words. He is able to keep you from stumbling. There's a tension here in keeping ourselves in the love of God and understanding in faith that he will keep us. I can sleep at night knowing that he does he does not sleep. He's holding on to me. Ultimately, I want us to get out of his character that he's trustworthy. He's good. He keeps his promises. He is faithful. And that's what 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 says. Faithful is he who calls you believer, who also will do it. That's, I need the peace of that. That it's not based on my own merit. It's not based on my own work and how well I keep myself in the love of God. I'm told to do it. And in obedience, I strive for that. And yet, no one will snatch them, me or you, believer, out of his hand. Recognize this, he protects his own. Are you in Christ? Are you part of the bride? He will protect his own. He will keep you. Second Thessalonians, we just looked at First Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians 3 says, Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified, just as it did also with you, and that we will be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. <laughs> He's good, and he protects his own. Lastly, he makes his own holy. Not like mostly holy. He makes us positionally righteous. We are as righteous, Christian, as Christ is himself in God's eyes. We have been justified by his atoning sacrifice. That is... <sighs> A relief. And, and it was done before I was born. It was pre-planned before the foundations of the earth were laid. That he would do this. Oh, that's good. Colossians 1, 22. This is one of my all-time favorite verses. But now he, God, reconciled you in the body of his, that's Christ's, flesh through death in order to present you before him, God, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So that, that, three, that three different terms communicates a complete perfection. You can thank God for that. He has done this. In today's message, We've been learning about keeping ourselves in the love of God, which is the main point. We started in Numbers 16. We saw Korah, Dathan, and Byram, the 250 leaders of Israel that raised up their fists against God and against Moses and Aaron. And we saw how the Lord dealt with them and their apostasy. We understood what apostasy was. And we took the main point from this message, I hope, that we are to keep ourselves in the love of God. 
We looked at the context of why Jude wrote this letter. He wrote it because the wolves that the apostles had warned about had come, and they were devouring the flock. Uh, That threat has not gone away just because the canon is closed. It's always been a threat. It'll be with us until the Lord takes us home. We need to know about that. And so we learned how to deal with it. We looked at addressing apostasy. This is a short form version of what we just learned. Our first point was forewarned is forearmed. And we took an observation from Acts. Deceivers desire division. That's their goal. They want to split. They want to break up. They want to reduce the effectiveness of Christ's church. They do that. Our application was that we are to seek loving unity, but never sacrifice truth to gain it. We can have friction. We can scuffle in the midst of the body, but we want the truth, don't we? Our eternity rests on that. I want the truth. I'm I'm betting the house on it. I want to know correctly. I know that I'm not We also looked at a warning. Heretics draw others after them because they do not care about the eternal consequences of sin. We contrast that with us. Like, oh, we really need to. We need to really think of the eternal consequences of of, uh, condoning sin, engaging in sin, continuing sin, rejecting the Holy Spirit. Like, there's consequences for them. Then we looked at a well-rounded strategy that looked at how we can keep ourselves in God's love. First, we are to build ourselves up. And we do that by looking at God's word, believing what he says about himself. Secondly, we learn to pray in the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's most effectively done, or at least enhanced, by thinking through God's word as we pray to him. Reading and praying simultaneously, that is richly enhanced, and then looking ahead for Christ's return. In that well-rounded strategy, we didn't just dwell upon ourselves. We learned to engage the at-risk, the doubters, those that are deceived, and those that are deceivers. We learned how we should interact with them. So we're to have mercy on those that are doubting. We're to save and snatch those that are being deceived, and we are to fear and hate the deceiver's sin. And then we concluded the message by looking at our third point, verses 24 and 25, those great, great, that great benediction of Jews to commit ourselves to the God who is trustworthy, who does protect and does make holy. So, in looking at that, I, I can't help but look at this passage and, and think he is worthy of our adoration. He, he thinks ahead to warn us. He doesn't leave us as sheep to be scattered. He warns, he protects, he loves. Now let's look ahead in conclusion. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. As I'm preaching and studying and building these messages, I look for passages that say the same thing, that enhance the the main point so that people who hear on different channels that understand in different ways can hear the truth and and grab onto it. 2 Peter chapter 3 does that well. Verse 1. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice. 
that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being deluged with water. But by his word, the, heaven, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some consider slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be found out. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens burning will be destroyed and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are looking for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. My friends, I would encourage you, keep yourselves in the love of God. Wait patiently for his coming. Don't stray after apostasy, those that rebel against the Lord. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Let's stand. I'll pray. Father God, we do honor you and magnify you and glorify you because of your Christ. You indeed are trustworthy. And we thank you that you protect your own and secure their eternity through the blood of your Christ. Oh, we love Jesus, Lord. Thank you that he has been so merciful to us by coming to die on the cross for our sins Thank you for receiving his sacrifice and accepting it as totally worthy. Lord, I pray that you will help us to obey you, to keep in the love of God. And may you be honored in this, Lord. May our lives shine as a testimony in this godless world that hates you. Keep us in your love, Lord. It's in Christ's name I pray.